Welcome back, friends. I'm Chris McLean, lead pastor at Shady Grove, and we are continuing our study of the book of Hebrews. Um, you might notice the picture behind me. It's a picture painted for a retreat, um, a youth retreat, and the theme was Heaven in the Real World because that was a song being used in the retreat. But as we're studying uh, the first and second chapter of Hebrews, uh, we might find that it's such an inappropriate picture to have behind me because what we really need to understand is that Christ is greater than the angels. So don't, don't, don't mistake the picture for anything other than the message of the greatness and fullness of Christ for salvation. Um, it's just a, a different message for a different opportunity um, to know that we have this gift of heaven in the real world really is the gift that we find in Christ and that Christ through the gift of the Holy Spirit enables us to live heaven in the real world. But I do think it's just ironic and wanted to point that out if it hadn't been already bugging you a little bit. All right, so here we are in chapter two and some recap from chapter one. You might remember that we said that first um, sentence in chapter one had some alliteration, that repeating of a consonant sound, particularly the Greek letter pi, or what we call P. And we said it was like having Peter packed a peck of pickled peppers mixed into the sentence. Well, in chapter two, right here at the beginning, we have it again, but instead of um, the, the five P's, we have four. So I guess Peter just packed a peck of peppers and, and didn't pickle them this time, I guess. Um, and so the words for that, I want to point them out to you. Uh, one of them is perisoturos. I'm not good at Greek words, but that means more abundantly, so much more abundantly. And prosecco, uh, which means to give heed, or in the Gospel of Matthew, it has the force of beware, beware. So more abundant bewareness is sort of where we are. Uh, pote, which means at any time and pararuamen, we should slip away. That's what those words mean. And see how it fits together. It says we must pay more, more abundant, careful attention. We must give great heed. We must beware, therefore, paying attention to what we have heard so that we don't drift away. So more abundantly, give heed, beware, so that at any time you don't slip away, drift away. And that word for slip away, drift away, uh, it's not one we see a lot of um, when we're studying the Greek. And it's one that's a nautical term. Again, we're learning this from Fred Craddock um, in this commentary. Um, this is not an attempt on my part to be original, but to pass on some helpful learning. And we talked about how this book and the series like it is found in our church library. So you have access to that. And one person in the um, online class actually bought a copy of it and got it for sale. And I got one for $12, so that was great. At any rate, so we have these P's and I'm not really good at poetry. Some of you might be, um, and maybe if we had done alliteration with an L, la 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 la, you might've said that lulls you to sleep. And the idea with a P, 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 p you know, that that's a more intense sound, like a bubba or a pup. Um, and that that, that kind of hammering of that noise gives you a, a poetic sense of the intensity that goes along with beware, give heed, pay abundant attention, you know, so that at all times you don't slip away, drift away. And so let's talk about that problem of slipping away or drifting away. Uh, sometimes when we're correcting somebody about something, it's about a specific error we might say, hey, uh, I don't think that's how that's pronounced, or maybe that's, that's not how to spell that, or I think you misunderstood what I was saying, let me explain. And, and we correct an error, and then that gives an opportunity for things to turn around quite quickly. But think about what it is to drift away, to just lose interest and attention, to fall slack. Which one is harder to get out of. I don't think that there's a perfect answer to that, but most of the folks, as we talked this week about the scripture, all agreed that there was something about that, that drifting away and that falling slack that can be 
uh, so difficult. And then one of the class members read from a commentary that she had uh, and was talking about um, the river Niagara. And, and you can drift away on that river and you get it already is the problem of falling off Niagara Falls. And so drifting away. Um, so we can drift away from things that are important to us, things um, that are central, that are meant to ground us. And, and what happens to life? How do we get dissipated and misdirected and lose time and opportunity as we drift away? And so this is an abundant matter that <laughs> get your attention, knock, 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 um, give heed, beware. And then we have this next verse. So check out verse two. It says, for if the message spoken by the angels was binding. And I'm just going to give you a head start. What it means when it says that it's actually talking about the law, uh, the law of Moses, the Torah, the commandments that we have. And you might think, was that spoken by the angels? And if you're wondering that good question and we'll get there, but we'll finish first. For if the message spoken by the angels was binding and every violation and disobedience of the law received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? And so what's being said here is, yeah, friends, we all know that if we break this law that we have from God, that, that there's a, a recompense. That's what Craddock, he says, a good translation for the word used in the Greek is recompense. Now, if you're you're being recompensated for something wonderful you've done. I guess it's actually a reward, but but otherwise, it, if it's really something problematic, then then those negative consequences, um, those negative outcomes come upon us. That that sort of punishing reality comes forth. And so, you know, if this law from God, if it's binding, if we're living against this law of life that we have from God, and we find ourselves quite naturally. If we ignore the lifeline that we have of salvation, we find ourselves in big, big trouble, right? Right off Niagara Falls, so to speak. How shall we escape then if we ignore such a great salvation, right? And so that ignore, drift away, so lax. Don't, don't let yourself slip away. Don't forget the great salvation. So what's the great salvation? Well, we remember... Uh, from last week when we were reading chapter one and celebrating this gift of Christ among us. Um, and I drew a terrible picture. Um, and maybe you drew a picture at home. Okay. So this salvation that we know through Jesus, the son, was first announced by the Lord. It was confirmed to us by those who heard him God also testified to it by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Now, last week, you might have said, Pastor Chris, you asked us to look for the Holy Spirit and we didn't see it. But here, here's one. You have one for your Holy Spirit column if you're keeping a list of, of qualities about the first and second and third parts of the Trinity. You have some grist for that Holy Spirit mill this time um, that we have gifts that are distributed, gifts of the Holy Spirit, distributed according to the will of God. So you can put that down. But one of the things that Craddock points out that's so interesting about this is we have an announcement from God as God is always revealing God's self to us. That's how we know about God. That's how we know about the hope we have in God, that God shows us that hope as an act of grace, an act of mercy, reaching out to us in our every need. And so... We have this announcement from God. It's passed down to us from and was testified to by those who heard. And then also God testifies by signs and wonders. And so it's really neat, the use of this word testify, that idea that we testify. Uh, if we were in a court case and somebody said, tell me what you know about God, you know, and I'll say, well, I, I, would, I would testify about what I knew. I would act as a witness and share what I knew about it. And God also participates uh, through signs and wonders telling us and telling us again. Uh, this week, uh, you're getting to look out my window and see some of the beautiful uh, forest that's behind me. Um, and that is a sign, that is a wonder. The sun is shining, that's a wonder. And one of the points that Craddock makes though, is I guess God could 
really terrorize us into a submission and make us to know everything. Um, but God testifies and doesn't force, shows God's self to us again and again through signs and wonders. Uh, but one of the things that Craddock emphasizes is that faith requires a, a response to that and not forcing, but a response of faith. And so there are miracles, there are signs, there are wonders in life and in the world around us, but they're not necessarily, all, you know, going to hit it home for us. Maybe we turn a blind eye to it. Maybe we say, oh, that's not a miracle. That, that was just luck or whatever we might say. Um, so there is still, even when God is reaching out and showing us God's presence, we still are given that freedom to see, to respond, to participate in this opportunity to share relationship and the love of God. Okay, so we're going to scoot on to the next section. So I want you to turn to verses 5 through 9. And in my commentary, it says, He became as we are. The Son of God became as we are. It says, It is not to angels that he, meaning God, has subjected the world to come, about which we are speaking. So the world to come is that, remember that eschaton, that end time, that um, everything is pointing um, to this great someday. You know, it says if you're getting ready for your wedding and, and all the preparations and all the invitations and all the decorations point to that wedding day <laughs> um, in that same way, um, in that world to come. And, and that we're seeing that world to come unfold now because Christ is among us, right? It's, we are living in these times. So it's not to angels that he subjected the world to come about which we are speaking. But there's a place where someone has testified and then you see a quotation of Psalm 8 verses 4 through 6 roughly. And one of the things that Craddock points out when it says there's a place where someone has testified. Um, why didn't um, why didn't the writer say hey in one of the Psalms, it says, um, well, that was actually a device that was used in ancient times where you really kept the focus on what it is you were saying rather than putting the focus on the person who said it. And that makes sense. We do the same thing today. If I'm getting ready to quote Mother Teresa, um, if I say, hey, Mother Teresa said, give without thought of reward, it's very likely that a certain part of my audience is gonna start thinking, Mother Teresa, I can never measure up, or Mother Teresa, wasn't she active in Calcutta? Or whatever that triggers for them, and they might miss the most important thing in that moment was that I wanted them to hear her wisdom, which was give without thought of reward, right? And so this is a common device still today. So it says, well, someone said, and then Psalm 8 is quoted. So I'll give you a moment to flip to it, and I will too. Psalm 8, verses 4 through 6. Here it comes. What are human beings that you are mindful of them? What are mortals that you care for them? So here we're talking to God and in the greatness of God. I mean, God doesn't have to be up per se, but it's a helpful convention. So in the greatness of God, where do we fit? Why? Why is God even thinking about us, caring for us? And yet you have made them, humankind, a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. And you might have a footnote on verse five. So in some translations, you'll hear, a little lower than the angels or a little lower than the divine beings rather than a little lower than God. And that's the version that seems to come over in Hebrews for us. And so in Hebrews, if we keep reading, 
here, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. And the only thing missing, Craddock says, is that dominion part. And we noticed that. And we wondered a little bit, why, why this emphasis on angels? Were some people worshiping angels and, and not being mindful of the greatness of Christ and the great salvation we know? I don't know for sure. That's certainly a worthy argument. Um, but for me, as I'm looking at it, the angel becomes kind of like a foil, just a helpful comparison point. Uh, if we have God on high, and then we say the angel, which we think is certainly above us, but we know an angel is below God. And then here we are. Um, it just gives us this middle reference point, you know, almost like on a piece of paper when you learned how to write as a child and, and it had that middle dashed line so that you knew kind of how high to make the, you know, the hump of your H go. Um, you know, just that middle reference point and the angels are in this sort of middle reference point and, and there's God above and here we are below. And then in the midst of that, we're trying to understand where does Jesus fit? Is Jesus up high? Is Jesus below the angels? Where, where is Jesus in all of this? And so here, the writer of the Hebrews has taken Psalm 8, and it's really originally written talking about our place in relationship with God and how God is loving us even in our smallness and what seems to be our appropriate insignificance, but we're significant to God somehow. And, and then listen what he does with it. And it talks about, the Psalm 8 talks about, you made him, meaning humanity, a little lower than the angels, right? Crowned him with honor and glory and put everything under his feet and putting everything under him, God left nothing that's not subject to him. Yet at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus. As you go along, and I agree with Craddock on this, as you're reading it, at first you're thinking about humanity, and yes, we're a little lower than angels. I can't believe God loves us like this. But as you're reading, and you, you've done all this study about Christ already, as you start reading and, and everything put under his feet, all of those illusions about Christ as the heir uh, of everything and at God's right hand, and it, you really just start hearing not that humans have some kind of dominion. You really hear it as Christ. And then he gets there. The writer says, at present, we do not see everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus. And so we're hearing a scripture that's talking about the, the amazing place that God in his mercy has allowed humans to have in creation a responsibility to participate as partner creatures to love creation um we don't see that happening and and always the best way sometimes um we have wonderful chances to participate and other times we squander the opportunity to care well for the gift of creation and love it the way god loves it um but then sort of in this place where the psalm has us thinking about our place with God and God, how are you mindful of us and, and our place? It's so much greater in creation than we would imagine. And, and are we really living up to that? And then we, and then we, we see Jesus come right in. We see Jesus. We see Jesus. Who was made a little lower than the angels. That's what got said about humankind. And Jesus is now crowned with glory and honor. So that's already real, right? That, that goodness of heaven already in the real world. Why? Because he suffered death. Oh. We're right now in the midst of a Winter Olympics um, when I'm filming this, and the person that gets the gold medal does not die before crossing the finish line. So this is something that does not easily compute Maybe if you've heard the gospel a whole lot, you're used to hearing it. But there's a shock here. We don't see everything subject to him, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. 
And so whatever's happening here, it's an act of grace, an act of the mercy of God. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about an idea from N.T. Wright. Um, I won't explain it as well as he does, uh, but he talks about how through the Old Testament, we see God call out Abraham and say, you know, I'm going to make your descendants like the stars of the sky. You're going to be a blessing to the world. The world will get blessed through your family. You'll be like a light to the nations. And, and then this heritage from Abraham is the heritage for the people of Israel meant to be a light to the nations, really a servant people that, that through uh, the servant love of the people of Israel showing the way of God in the world, living that law rightly and showing that hope of a fulfilled and whole humanity. Um, and the nations would come and, and see the greatness of God. Um, but if we keep reading through the Old Testament, we realize that they just, people say, man, um, it just seems like, you know, hear God's people and and they're on the way, and then ugh, they, you know, they drift away, they fall away, they make these horrible mistakes, and sin just keeps showing up. Israel can't be faithful. And, and yet here's Jesus born within Israel. And so N.T. Wright calls Jesus the faithful Israelite and shows us how that call of Israel is fulfilled in Jesus. And we see this similar reflex here. We're in, in Psalm 8 where we see um, this potential, this hope, this call that God has given humanity that we just don't quite live up to. We don't, we don't see this dominion and this, you know, being over creation in a good and right way. Um, we just don't see that. Um, but we see Jesus fulfilling and showing the way of that healed and whole humanity. Um, and so that gets us ready for the next section. So if you'll flip, we're going to start over with verse 10. And speaking of Jesus, it says, And bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, right? That's how great God is. It's fitting that God should make the author of that salvation perfect through suffering. And one of the, the cute things that Craddock notices is, is that somebody writing this had the nerve uh, to sort of give God like an A plus, you know, God, that was so fitting. Way to go, God. It's like one of my sons when he was five years old and I took him to his first roller coaster ride and we're getting ready to get on the Loch Ness Monster and he's he's right there in the train. He's wondering how are we going to get on the tracks and then and how we're going to get on this train and then it pulls right up in front of us and he says, that's so convenient, you know, God, this is so fitting and bringing many sons to glory. It's fitting that you who made everything, everything exists through you and that you should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. And the word perfect here, uh, Craddock reminds us, does not mean blameless per se, um, but complete, complete whole. And so how is this a complete fit this this complete salvation it says the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers he says I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation I will sing your praises and again I will put my trust in him and again he says here I am and the children God has given me. And so one of the things we see happening here is this deep identification of Jesus, truly human as we are human. Now, again, since we're going through the Olympics, um, one of the things I'm not is I'm not very coordinated. That's why I try not to ever dance where anybody can see me because I trip myself even just dancing um, alone. It doesn't mean I don't like to dance. I just do it alone. Um, but if you take clumsy little me and you put um, an Olympic champion next to me, a figure skating champion next to me, even if that person holds my hand, I have not gotten more coordinated. We are really not the same ilk. 
But Jesus is the same ilk. And therefore, the argument is, we are helped. We are one. This Jesus is one with us. His victory is shared as our victory because our brokenness was shared as, as his brokenness. And so it's pointed out, it's almost like an onion layers, all the ways that Jesus is connected to us, that we are the same family. We are brothers. We are in the same congregation. We are praising one God together. We are children of that God together. We both, Jesus and we, have flesh and blood. He shared in the humanity that we know so that by his death, that's a death like our death, he might destroy the one who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. And so Jesus meets us in every nook and cranny of our lives, especially in the deepest parts that need help, saving, relief from fear, healing reaches all the way into all those places, and we're not alone in any of them. Because God, through Christ, is with us. That's amazing. That's amazing. And think about that part about fear of death. And sometimes we hear people in TV shows say, well, are you afraid to die? I'm not afraid to die. Um, and so maybe we just are kind of blasé about that. Um, but if you lose your job, how does that feel? It feels pretty awful um, because then you you can't provide and you can't feed and, and what will happen to you? Well, the worst end of the road is, is we die, right? And so we too participate in a fight uh, the basic level is, is a fight to survive. If we get that one knocked out, then we can push on thriving, right? And isn't the thing we find ourselves pushing against in one form of another a death? We don't want to die relationally or socially. We don't want to die intellectually. We, we don't want to forget the things we've known. We don't want to be forgotten. We are afraid of dying. And we know that, that we all die. And Jesus enters into all of that fear. That fear that we fight against. And sometimes we fight against it in really horrible ways. We get into horrible competition where it becomes this what's called a zero-sum game, right? It's win or lose. That, that if you win, I lose. If you live, I die. And, and you see a really intense building tension and you're seeing it everywhere. You're seeing it in our fiction. You're seeing it in the news. Well, if those people um, come or have this or get this, then we won't have. And so there's just this zero-sum game being articulated globally as we get increasingly anxious about one another. Um, and the way that, that in response to that, we're willing to to not notice our common humanity and our common needs and work for common good and share the common love of God is the first thing we do, but instead we get self-protective. And in that you see sin and that sin, that greed, that jealousy, that fear, that anxiety, that pushing away, the indifference, and I don't want to see you. That's a lot of sin. Guess what? It's hooked into the fear of death expressed on social and national levels. Jesus interrupts all of that by actually entering into it. He, he's died for all of us through the grace of God. He frees us from that fear. And so then our writer says, For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way. So, so how is it that Jesus dropped below that middle line in the, in the lined paper? How did he drop below the angel line? He had to. The angels weren't the ones who needed the help. We needed the help. And he came all the way 
where we are. That's why he dropped below that line, showing that amazing mercy of God. And in that being a faithful high priest in service to God. And so a priest is somebody from among the people that acts in, in ways that help the people experience that they are made at one with God again. And so that he might make atonement at one minute for the sins of the people because he himself suffered when he was tempted he is able to help those who are being tempted. And so this chapter ends with that, that emphasis. Uh, here we are, Jesus is like us, and a brother, our family, worshiping God like we do. God is our common hope. Um, and here, even tempted as we are, suffering, dying, tempted as we are. And, and it sounds a little funny, this last verse, this verse 18. Uh, instead of being a closure, it sounds like it's kind of opening the next thing. And so maybe you can think about your English teacher trying to get you to put in a transition sentence. And, and maybe that's what we have. We'll find out next week. If you want to look ahead, check out chapter three. So glad to be with you today. And let's end with a prayer. Gracious God, we thank you for your life in the midst of our lives. We thank you for your word, for the testimony that's been faithfully handed down in this um, this relay race of faith help us to receive your word to live your hope and to pass it on in jesus name we ask it amen friends have a great day thanks for joining